we have been talking about authentic Pentecostalism over the last number of weeks. And we've talked about the four foundations of the Pentecostal teaching. And they are these, Jesus is Savior, Jesus is Healer, Jesus is Baptizer, and Jesus as the Coming King. And we talked about Jesus being the Savior, and one of the, the great phrases of the church is this thought that Jesus saves. And uh, sometimes people make fun of that. They say, Jesus saves. What's going on? I'm not drowning. What, what do you talk about? Jesus saves. And scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, this is uh, the, uh, the part of the Christmas story. And the angel says to Joseph, she shall give birth to a son, and you shall give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus came to do that. Jesus saves us from our sins. Hallelujah. How does he do it? He does it through his precious blood. Hallelujah. Thank you for the song selection on this Communion Sunday. You know, some churches you go to and you won't hear a song about the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not good. Thank you for leading us in worship and centering on the blood of Jesus Christ because it is through Jesus' blood that we are saved. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is also our healer. And he wants to bring healing to us physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially. He wants to come and bring healing to the whole of our lives and to the whole of humanity. Jesus is baptizer. In Acts chapter 1 verse 5 it says, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus still baptizes people with the Holy Spirit. And the last few weeks we've been dealing with this thought that Jesus Christ is our soon coming King. We expect Jesus Christ to come back at any time to straighten out this old world. The Bible teaches us that this doctrine does several things for us. We've talked about how the belief in the soon return of Christ brings zeal to the church. It brings sacrifice to the church. It brings holiness to the church. Last week we had dealt with the thought that it brings hope to the church. Hallelujah. The Bible refers to this, this hope as our blessed hope. This, it's, it's a blessed hope. It's a hope that produces joy and happiness within us. Last week we dealt with the thought that Jesus Christ will return with a shout. We talked about the shout of the Lord. Hallelujah. When he shouts, things happen. When he speaks, things will be changed. The Bible says that, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, and we will be changed when he shouts. In a, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, we will be changed. Listen, when that trumpet sounds, and when Jesus Christ shouts the battle cry, this is the thought that the, uh, says, and the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Last week we shared that that word shout means the great commander will lead his army in a great battle cry. And when he cries out, when he shouts, we will be changed. It's not that we may be changed, or we'll think about being changed, but in that split second, in the twinkling of an eye, our bodies will be transformed. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to that time. And I know that you are as well. Today I want to think about the return of Christ. I want to look at, in a little bit more detail, what the last days will look like. And in a short length of time we have this morning, we certainly can't go into a great detail, but I want to talk about three events that, that set in the near future. The timeline of the future events can be divided up into three major events. And I've got a chart, you can just flip that chart up, and we're going to talk about the, uh, oh look, I'm missing my lines. That worked perfectly on my computer. Click it again, see where we go to. Oh, yeah. Click back. Uh, there's supposed to be a timeline that runs along there to show there's a timeline. But the three major events will be the rapture, 
the tribulation and the return of Christ. That's the three major events that are setting in our future. Technology may mess up my sermon this morning, folks. I don't know uh, if it's a translation between uh, Windows and the Mac, but it was perfectly on my computer this morning. I edited it again this morning. So, uh, John, I don't know if you can uh, go back and have a look, but if there's anything you can do, I can go without slides, but it would be nice to have the slides. And uh, that is not my full slide. We'll start off with the rapture. The rapture of the church. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Open your Bibles there and follow along with me. We may have that up on the scripture as well. If we can go to our next slide, we'll walk through this. And uh, if, uh, if they edit it and the scriptures drop down, then um, you've got your Bibles open anyway. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18 speak about the rapture. Starting at verse 13, it says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who've fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Paul here is addressing a problem and, and we see an evidence of what's going on within the church. The church is struggling because the early church believed that they would see Jesus Christ return in their lifetime. And time is passing here. Jesus Christ hasn't returned and some people have died. Some people have died because of persecution. Some people have died because of age. Some people have died because of sickness. And the question has come up. They're asking, what is happening to those who are dying before Jesus comes? Where do they go? What happens to them? And so Paul begins to explain this. They were missing some vital information. And because of this, people were upset. When someone died... They were mourning and they were mourning deeply. And Paul explains to them, don't mourn like you have no hope. And he begins to explain why we have hope. Verse 14 says this, We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. Paul here begins to explain about the, the return of Christ and he begins with the familiar. He begins with something they're sure of. They, the, he begins with a doctrine that is absolutely firm within their, within their hearts. He says, you believe that Jesus died and rose again. Folks, that's the fundamental uh, doctrine of Christianity. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he says, you believe this, right? You believe that Jesus died and rose again, right? Okay, we believe that. Jesus died and he rose again, but he also died leaving us a promise. Matthew, uh, sorry, John chapter 14 tells us this. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, or some translations will say, in my Father's house there are many rooms or many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Jesus promised that he would come back for those who had died. He promised that he would prepare a place for them and take them home to be with him. So he's saying, you believe that Jesus died and rose again. Believe what he taught you. Believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Verse 15. According to the Lord's own words. Paul here is referring to his own personal revelation. Paul received this from God himself. And he begins to explain what's going to take place. According to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive and who are left to the coming of the Lord 
or certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. He talks about those who have died, those who have already gone on, that those individuals will precede those who go in the rapture. The dead in Christ will rise before we do. We believe that he is saying that as soon as we die, our soul ascends to heaven and we go to be with God. Those who died before us are there in the presence of God. Those who have, who have, who have died since I've been here, where are they? What's happened to them? Oh, we know where their bodies are, but their soul is in heaven with Jesus Christ. Verse 17 says, And after that, we who are alive and remain and are left will be caught up together with, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will we be with the Lord forever. Encourage one another with these words. This thought that we will be caught up together. And we've shared that the word rapture, although it's not found in the English Bible, it's found in the Latin Bible. It's a Latin word meaning to be caught up, to be snatched away. Jesus Christ is going to come and snatch us away to go into his presence. Hallelujah. The tribulation. Try my chart again. Are we there? Not there yet. They're working on my chart. The tribulation. The tribulation is a seven year period that great distress will come upon the earth. The scripture often warns about this. That there is coming a time that there will be a, a time of great distress. Matthew chapter 24 verse 21 says this. For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never will be equaled again. There is coming a time of great distress. A seven year period referred to as the tribulation. Jeremiah speaks of it this way in chapter 30 verse 7. It says, how awful will, will it be? Now, none will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. It will be a time of great difficulty, this seven year tribulation period that the scripture speaks about. It will be particularly a difficult time for Israel or Jacob. Daniel chapter 1 20, uh, chapter 12 verse 1 says this at that Michael the great prince who protects your people will rise there will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of the nations until then but at that time your people everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered Daniel adds something extra and as he's explaining this event and Daniel is the, is the great prophet of the Old Testament that understood the end times and what would take place in the last part of the church age, the last part before Jesus returns. He said there would be a time of great distress, but there would be a group of people that would be delivered, and there are a group of people who, whose name is found written in a book. How many could guess what book that is? The Bible calls, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, calls it the book of life. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it calls the book the Lamb's book of life. How do you get your name in the Lamb's book of life? Can I tell you, there's only one way to get your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. is accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ that can wash away your sins. Nothing but putting your faith in the, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ that can bring salvation. And the Bible says your name will be written in God's book. The Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation chapter 20 tells us this. 
verse 12, and I said, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books, plural, the books were opened, and another book, singular, another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded within the books, plural, within the books. And anyone, who's, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This need for our name to be in the book, the book of life. The Lamb's book of life. Anyone whose name was written in the book. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you. Anyone whose name, whose name was found in the book, can I tell you, I believe Jesus Christ is returning soon. There is coming a time of great distress upon this earth. And the only deliverance will be for those whose name is written in the book of life. Those whose name is written in the book of life will be snatched away, will be raptured, will be caught up together and taken away from this time of great tribulation. This world has seen difficult times. You think of some of the struggles this world has gone through. Think of the Middle Ages when the Black Plague went through. Difficult times. You think about the wars, those who suffered. Think about Europe during the, the great world wars. It has nothing to compare with what is coming. There's coming a time that is worse than anything else this world has ever seen. The only hope of freedom and deliverance is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Your name has to be in the book. Your name has to be in the book of life. The seven year period of tribulation is divided up into two parts. Each of three and a half years. Wow, didn't that work nice? The first three and a half years of this time of tribulation. It will be a time of war and disaster. It's a time of, 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 of great earthquakes. It's a time when God's hand of protection comes off of this planet and Satan comes with his fuel, full fury against the lives of people. But that's only the first half. The second half of the tribulation is referred to as the Great Tribulation. The first half is worse than anything the world has ever seen. The last half is worse than that. Because not only is Satan raging, not only has God taken his hand of restraint off this earth, but the last three and a half years, God pours out his judgment upon this world. And when God judges this planet, it will be very bad. Can I tell you, the one way out is to have your name written in the book. Make sure that your heart is right with God. Make sure that you're ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Because the things that will happen, you don't want to be here. I don't have time to talk about all the things that will happen. But if you read Revelation, particularly chapters 5 on through to chapter 19, you'll see that it will not be a point that you will want to be here. It's interesting, Daniel, if I can go to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel talks about this tribulation and he maps it out a bit for us. 
Revelation maps it out a bit better for us, but the book of Daniel, in a very abbreviated way, maps this, this uh, tribulation time out for us. And he maps it out with the prophecy of the 77s. And I want to run through this quickly and explain a little bit about the tribulation. He says the 77s are decreed for your people and for your holy city to finish transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Seventy sevens. What is he speaking about? First of all, I'll say this. We know that the Jews divided the week into a seven-day week, right? Do you remember why they did it? They did it because God created the earth in how many days? Six days. I thought someone was going to say seven. He created the, the earth in six days. And what did he do in the seventh? He rusted. And he set up a principle for the Jews to have a seven-day week. But I don't know if you also knew this, but God also taught them to divide their years up into a seven-year period. How many knew that? The same way. Leviticus chapter 25 says this, six years, for six years sow your fields, and for six years prune your vineyards, and gather your crops. But on the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath rest. Not only did they have a six-day week, but they also had a system of seven years, a seven-day week, and a seven-year period. On the seventh day they rested, on the seventh year the land rested. In fact, you'll find there are several times that God punished them for not allowing their land to rest on the seventh year. He speaks about the 77s, he's speaking about 70 seven-year periods. Listen to this. Seventy seven-year periods. He's speaking about a 490-year period. In 490, year, 490 years, in this verse, it tells us what's going to take place. Number one, after those 77s, there will be, uh, they will finish transgressions. In other words, rebellion will be over. The second thing is there will be an end of sin. There will be no more sin. How do you think that sounds good? Rebellion will be over. Rebellion, which is, which is the work of the enemy in people's lives. That will be over. The work of sin will be finished on this earth. There will be an atone for wickedness. In other words, God will be finished with His judgment. God's judgment will be satisfied. There'll be a bringing in of everlasting internal righteousness. That this earth will become absolutely righteous. All the vision and the prophecies will be fulfilled. And the Messiah will be anointed king over the world. How many think that sounds like a good time? He's saying, I'm setting a timeline in place. That's, that he's saying that... that, that Rebellion will be over, sin will be over, God's judgment will be over, the land will be covered with righteousness, all the prophecies and visions will be fulfilled, and Jesus Christ will be anointed king of this old earth. He said, this is going to happen in 490 years. Let's look at the next verse. Know and understand this, from the issue of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in a time of trouble. Starting period of this 490 years of a time clock being started was when Nehemiah was commanded to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. That took place 
in March 19, uh, uh, of, of 445 B.C. Let's go to my chart. I should have a chart that's going to work. There we go. The year 445 B.C. is the date of the decree. 49 years was given to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to repair its streets, and to put the trench around the city. 49 years for it to be completed. Let's go to our next one. Next slide. And then he said there was seven sevens and then 62 sevens. 62 sevens. 62 sevens to what? 62 sevens until the anointed one. So there was 49 years for rebuilding Jerusalem and then there would be another 62 sevens or 434 years before the Messiah. Or from the going forth of the command, if we go to the next chart, I think I've got it on the next one. From the, the decree in 445 B.C. to the Messiah, he says there's going to be eight, uh, 483 years. Look at our next verse. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end will come like a flood. War will continue to the end. Desolations will be decreed. Back to our chart again. Some people read this chapter of uh, this section of, of Daniel and not understood it. Let me explain where people make their mistake in understanding this. If you look at the, the thought from the going forth of this decree in 445 BC, <clears throat> that's clear. We know when that took place. And if you go 483 years to when that says the Messiah will be cut off, you end in the year 37 AD. Well, that isn't when Jesus died. The best guess of when he died was 30 AD. The difficulty is this. How many days in our year? 365 and a quarter, adding leap year. The Jewish calendar did not have 365. They had 360, that's right. When you take this time and you use the 360-day calendar, you end up in your year 30 AD, which is when Jesus died. Perfect according to prophecy, according to the Jewish understanding of the year. Let's go on to verse 27. Note in the last verse that the Messiah would be cut off, the city would be devastated, and the temple destroyed. In the next verse, he says, and he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, one seven. In the middle of the seven, he'll put an end to sacrifice and offerings and on and on a wing of the temple he will set up an abomination will cause desolation until the end is decreed that is decreed is poured on him follow along in the scripture just look at it for a second he will confirm a covenant for seven years that's important for us to know how long is the tribulation? Seven years. At the beginning of the tribulation, we will find that there will be a seven-year peace accord with the nation of Israel. And in the middle of this seven years, he will end the sacrifice 
taking place and the offerings. It tells us something else. It tells us the temple is going to be rebuilt, probably during the first half of the tribulation, partly because of this peace agreement. It appears that there will be a peace agreement in the Middle East that will allow the nation of Israel to rebuild the temple. Temple sacrifice will begin. But part way through the, this, this seven year peace accord, in the middle of it, this, this leader, this individual, will put an end to the sacrifice and set himself up as God within the temple. Who is this leader? We don't know. There's an indication from this that he comes from the renewed Roman Empire. Why do we say that? I say that because if you look at the previous verse, the previous verse talks about the, the leader coming. And it says that uh, uh, the people of the ruler will come and destroy this city and the sanctuary. The people of the ruler. The armies of Rome will come. And the next verse it simply refers to him as he will. So there seems to be a connection to the revived Roman Empire and this new leader that's going to come. From Scripture we know this. We need to be aware. There is coming a seven year peace agreement. Watch out for it. We will see a rebuilding of the temple. Do you know they already have the instruments of the temple prepared? When uh, Alan Baker was with us back a few years ago, uh, back a few few months ago, he was shown some pictures. Did he show you the picture of the uh, the candlestick that's prepared? It's all done. It's all completed. The instruments to go in the temple are completed. In fact, they've tried to lay the cornerstone several times. The temple will be rebuilt. There's coming a one world government, a one world religion, and a one wild world financial system. Folks, watch out for it. It is coming. We need to have our hearts right with the Lord. Because this time will be the worst the world has ever seen. Make sure your heart is right with God. What will happen after this wicked leader comes? What will happen at the end of this seven years of tribulation? At the end of the seven years of tribulation, the next great event is the return of Jesus Christ. The Bible describes it this way in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19 says this, I saw heaven standing open, there was before me. Uh, and Let me try this again. And I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called the faithful and true. With justice he will judge and make war. His eyes were like blazing fire. And on his head was many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He was dressed in a white robe, dipped in blood. And his name is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which he struck down the nations and he will rule them with an iron scepter he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of almighty God and on his robe and on his side he has this name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords Jesus Christ is coming back goes on in chapter 20 and says this and I saw an angel come down out of heaven and having the keys of the abyss and holding in his hands a great chain, he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is coming back. Folks, that's the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ is fully revealed, not just as a babe in a manger, but as He's revealed as who He truly is, God Himself, coming to rule this nation, or coming to rule this world. Can I say, 
the signs of the times are evident. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Matthew warns us in Matthew chapter 24 that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famine, earthquakes in various places and he says this is the beginning of birth pains and I believe that we are living in this time when nation has rose against nation and kingdom against kingdom. If you, you read that closely what it is saying is one nation will rise against another nation and very quickly this nation will gather around it a group of nations and this other nation will gather around it another group of nations and they will face off in a war. From the time of Jesus' birth until today there's been an estimated 15,000 wars. And up to 1914 this prophecy had not been filled because it was nation against nation or a group of nations against a nation. But in 1914, it became two nations, then two groups of nations very quickly, and they faced off in the great First World War. And we can say that from the First World War, if you remember your history, after the First World War, the Jews were brought back into Israel. The First World War returned Israel, returned the Jews to Israel. The Second World War returned Israel, that land, back into the hand of the Jews. The Bible says this is the beginning of the birth pains. We are living in the last days. He said there'd be an increase and famine in a quarter of our world is starving. There would be an increase in earthquakes. And if you go and look up earthquakes, you'll find that earthquakes since 1970 have been on the increase. And since the turn of the new uh, 2000, since the turn of the century, earthquakes, severe ones, have been on a tremendous increase. And he says, this is the birth pains telling us that the time is near. Open your hearts up and hear what the Lord is saying because I believe the return of Jesus Christ is at hand. Is your heart ready? He goes on in Matthew 24 and tells us this. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Israel has always been referred to as the fig tree. 1940, uh, 1945, Israel became a nation. 1967, it gained Jerusalem. The fig tree is blossoming. We are near the return of Jesus Christ. Are you ready for his return? and invite the team to come back. The last three weeks I've talked about making sure your heart is ready. The question is, are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Are you ready for the rapture of the church? I'll ask that question again. Are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Is your name written in the book of life? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you haven't, can I encourage you to make that decision today? Accept Him as your Savior. I want to take time for communion. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, I, I always feel one of the best times to accept Christ as your Savior is around the communion table. When we celebrate the death of Christ, His shed blood and His broken body. Because it's a time for all of us as believers to search our hearts, to make sure our hearts are right with God. And if you're here today and your heart isn't right with God, 
as an opportunity for you to make your heart right with our Savior. Stand with me.